Hello there, you're watching CNN News 18. I'm Maha Siddiqui. Afghanistan is in the grip of uh, the Taliban already. Meanwhile, what we are seeing currently over there is efforts to build on a new government by the Taliban. But while everybody else is evacuating from Afghanistan, their diplomats, personnel, citizens, what are we seeing Pakistan do? Their foreign minister, Shah Mahmood Qureshi, is expected to be in Kabul tomorrow. So is it now pretty much clear that Pakistan was the force behind Taliban, emboldening the Taliban to take on power by force in Afghanistan? That's going to be our subject of discussion this evening. And what should India be doing under these circumstances? Whether it is in Afghanistan or against India, groups like Lashkar-e-Toiba and jaish e mohammed continue to operate with both impunity and encouragement. It is therefore vital that this council does not take a selective, tactical or even a complacent view of the problems we face. Let's now take a look at this unholy alliance that has come to the fore quite clearly, that between Pakistan and the Taliban. First of all, Pakistan is going to play a key role now in building the Taliban regime in Afghanistan. This is absolutely clear now with the, the news that Shah Mahmood Qureshi is going to be visiting Kabul tomorrow. Pakistan... Foreign minister is likely to visit Kabul, as I was just pointing out, for talks. Talks with Haqqani Network and Taliban factions as well. Now, if there are various factions, as we have been talking about, as Taliban doesn't seem to be a monolith, what uh, Pakistan is also likely to do is bring them all together. At least that's what they are hoping to be able to do. Pakistan wants a key role for the Haqqani Network as well. And remember... Only yesterday, External Affairs Minister S. Jay Shankar pointed out about how the Haqqani network is trying to take over and influence. The terror influence is increasing in Afghanistan. He said this at the United Nations Security Council. Pakistan seeks control of key ministries via proxies. So their idea is to step into the Taliban regime themselves and yield influence over there. Pakistan's backed L.E.T., Lashkar -e Taiba and Jaish -e Mohammed will also be part of that entire terror nexus. Uh, that has also been constantly pointed out by India that the 20 terror organizations, the around 20 terror organizations that Taliban supported, two of them directly targeting India, L.E.T. and J.E.M. Pakistan wants uh, them also to be operating on Afghanistan soil. So clearly things as far as India is concerned, are clearly difficult at the moment. How is India going to tackle that? That's our topic of discussion this evening. Chris Alexander, former Canadian ambassador uh, to Kabul, is going to join us in a bit. Ji Parthasarthi, former diplomat, uh, he served in Pakistan. Amar Sinha, former ambassador of India to Afghanistan. And Fazal Hakmal will also be joining us in a bit. He's an Afghan war veteran. Let me first come to you, Ambassador Partha Sarthi. What surprises many is why didn't the US see this? Or did they see the nexus between Pakistan and Taliban and turn a blind eye to it? If so, why? Political decision. It was not a diplomatic decision to pull out. And with by, uh, uh, that being done by President Trump, obviously President Biden could not ignore it. And the dates were set, the meetings were held, and uh, they went ahead with the decision. So it was purely U.S. domestic politics for which President uh, Biden is now getting uh, really uh, severely uh, criticized. But uh, coming to the situation here in Pakistan, uh, I don't think we should feel so worried or concerned. We are back to a normal we were a couple of years ago. But there are differences now, as I see it. Mullah Baradar, don't forget, 
he was held in jail for eight years by Pakistan. Yes, yes. yes. Second is that Hibatullah Akunzada, who's really the ideological head and the boss and would normally have been the equivalent of, should have been the equivalent of Ayatollah Khomeini in Afghanistan. He is not. He's not in the scene. Hmm. Mullah Baradar has taken over. Now, uh, therefore, I, I, I think we have to bear these things in mind and not rush to any decisions. Hmm. Hmm. We have to take a very strong stand when it comes to the rights of women. There can be no compromise on that hmm. as far as I'm concerned. Okay. Uh, okay. And I'm certain the government and, and the people of India feel that way. All right. So All right. I, th I think the focus will be on that. But let's also be very clear. Hmm. Hmm. Within Afghanistan, there is a resistance growing. It is read by Amrullah Saleh, the former prime minister, uh, vice president. And its, mesu, its members include um, Ahmed Shah Masood, the legendary hero, his son. So, Tajik areas, they are having problems and this will spread. All right. There is I, this I'll interrupt you there, sir, for a bit because we were also getting some reports that even that faction is now in talks with Taliban. How is that likely to play out? I'll come back to you on that in a bit. But Amar Sina, I want to bring you in over here. Would the Taliban want any meddling now that they've got power in Afghanistan? Would they even want Pakistan to come and meddle in their affairs now? Well, uh, Thank you for having me. Uh, no, if if I had to give a straight, quick answer, uh, obviously no. Uh, and that is the uh, the fear that Pakistan should worry about is that they overplay their hand. They have brought Taliban to this position, but Afghans historically and by very nature, the way the society is structured, does not accept any foreign domination. Now, even Pakistan is foreign as far as Taliban is concerned. And that is why Mr. Qureshi is uh, going post haste to Kabul, mm. because he wants to be a key player in getting his proteges the right portfolios. As if you recall, last time Sirajuddin Haqqani was a minister in the Taliban government, he looked after frontier affairs, which is basically concerns his own domain mm. uh, on the Afpak region. This time around, I have a feeling that they would like to take over security and defense uh, portfolios. Uh, already the defense of Kabul is in the uh, hands of uh, uh, Haqqani fighters. Uh, and that is a key way of controlling the population in, in, in Kabul, which is becoming restive, hmm. uh, which is resisting. And I have a fear that uh, Pakistan may just overplay the hand once again. Hmm. Okay. Over all right. I'll go across to Fazl now. Fazl, is there any doubt left that Pakistan did embolden Taliban? Was there evidence to this on ground, even as the war continued against the Taliban? Was that was that, was that yes, question that, that, to me? Yes, that's for you. Well, can you can you repeat that question, please? The Sorry, quest, I was. Uh, no worries. The question is that: uh, Is there any doubt at all left now that Pakistan did in fact embolden Taliban? Well, uh, this is uh, this is what gets uh, lost in. Uh, mainstream and in the overarching narrative when we talk about the Taliban and when we define the Taliban. We have, I, I, and I call on mo, uh, on experts uh, that, 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 work, uh, that provide views and, uh, and comments and expertise on, on that region, specifically the, on the Afghan war, mm -hmm. to do a better job of defining who the Taliban are. That, for the Afghans, now, for for most Afghans, we look at the Taliban as the force multipliers of GHQ ISI. If you are giving the Taliban any other definition, I think you're way away from the facts and you're sticking to a narrative that, that's been promoted by Pakistani military industrial complex. Pakistan has been behind the Taliban. Pakistan wants the Taliban in power, no doubt. But the, the Taliban, you know, they're not going to they're not going to resist the Pakistan because they know that the Taliban are in power today because the Pakistanis provided them the support. Hmm. So there will be no, there will be no uh, time where the Pakistanis are going to stay away from the Taliban or the Pakistanis will lose leverage over the Taliban. They will continue to have leverage. And the fact that Prime, uh, Foreign Minister Qureshi is visiting Kabul uh, over the very near future is because he is going to try to make peace between the different factions within the Taliban, the Haqqani network, the, mm. the, 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 
the faction from Kandahar because, again, they cannot agree on forming a government. They're asking the Haqqani network is asking for more say, more sway, more okay. role and okay. positions in the government. He gave the position. All right. Because they say they've been, they've been putting the actual fight. All right. Fazal, I'll, I'll interrupt you there. You seem to be differing from what uh, Amar Sinha just said. And I'll go back to uh, the panelists then on what you are now putting forward as an argument. But before that, I'll go across to G. Parthasarthi. Ambassador Parthasarthi, Pakistan, as you rightly mentioned, kept Mullah Brother in jail for almost eight years under pressure from the U.S. Then how come for Mullah Brother, Pakistan still remains some sort of a friend? Mullah Brother is a realist. No single person wields supreme power and can ignore the others. To me, very frankly, the danger, man, as the ambassador, my colleague said, hmm. is the Haqqani network. And Sirajuddin Haqqani is a Pakistan ISI protege. Hmm. If you visit Islamabad or Rawalpindi, you'll find they have large uh, uh, mansions there. They live there luxuriously. And they also have a home in uh, North Waziristan, uh, where... Uh, the, uh, the the uh, sort of fight to uh, they take off from important point also to be borne in mind there is mm. substantial Pashtun discontent within Pakistan and the Tariq Taliban mm. is a manifestation of that discomfort so you have one school of Pashtuns well fed by the Pakistanis mm. and another uh, pretty strong about it. Hmm. So I think you're into a very complex situation. Hmm. There are no easy definitions. Hmm. But we can say this, that in an ultimate analysis, a Pashtun thinks not far beyond his own tribe. This is why the Pakistanis worry about the border, because Pashtuns keep coming across and going. And they had carried out military operations which haven't pleased their own Pashtuns. Okay. So as I said, it's into a much more uh, a complex, complex situation complex. and yeah. we'll have to take it as it comes all right all right so let's let's get down now to india's strategy amar sinha uh, we'll have to take it as it comes is what g parthasarthi is saying what do you think india should be doing after all uh, it, it's no secret now that india was trying to reach out to the taliban uh, a couple of months ago uh, the Contact with the top political head, Mullah Brother, could not be made. But nonetheless, India was being pragmatic uh, under the current geopolitical circumstances and trying to reach out to Taliban. Do you think that should be stepped up now to ensure that terror outfits working against India like LET and JEM do not start targeting India even further? No, absolutely. Uh, that is what we need to work on. The fissures within Taliban work on factions which uh, don't have animosity towards India. Uh, and uh, our access previously obviously were circumscribed because of the location. See, the Taliban leadership lives in Quetta, uh, in Pakistan. And obviously we had zero access. Doha office was accessible. Uh, and I think we did have informal contacts with them. Yes. Uh, you have to remember that Haqqanis have been, they are on the terror list of the UN, of the US, but still since 2015, they have been mainstreamed. Uh, Pakistanis had foreseen this situation and they had brought, in, brought them in as the number two uh, slot in leadership position in Taliban so that they already get whitewashed when the government formation or power sharing happens here. Yeah. Hmm. So we will have to work with those factions which we feel hmm. are not completely controlled by Pakistan. Hmm. And, and I, I believe that we will have opportunities. And I slightly disagree. The Taliban uh, will listen to Pakistan as long as their families are held hostage in Pakistan. Once they come back, once they try to run a government in Afghan, hmm. uh, no Afghan government really can have credibility if they're seen as a puppet of Pakistan. Hmm. All right. So we need to work on that aspect. Perhaps India needs to work on that aspect uh, uh, to cut Pakistan down to size, at least in this situation. Fazl, I want to come to you about one important aspect that you raised in one of our shows previously, and that is about uh, the arms and ammunition that will now be in the hands of Taliban. This is going to be a big 
danger now uh, for this entire region that was not expected but this is happening now how do you see that falling in the hands of uh, elements like terrorists who are going to be you know breeding on this ground now as is a possibility reflected by india in the united nations security council only yesterday by the external affairs minister s j shankar hey look uh, uh, first of all uh, i i do not think that the taliban will last long in afghanistan i do not think that they will have their uh, their 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 hands uh, in kabul for that long there's still a lot to to, to wait for uh, some of your colleagues earlier brought in, uh, brought up and mentioned that resistance in uh, northern Afghanistan. Yes. There were uh, uh, significant uh, uprisings in eastern and, and western Afghanistan, and as a matter of fact, in, in southern Afghanistan. The, the, the Taliban, no doubt, that 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 are under in a lot of influence from 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 Pakistan. The fact that the Doha negotiations, the fact that the peace did not work because it was because there was no mutually hurting opportunity. Pakistan, the Taliban leadership, for the most part, lived in Pakistan. They were living a luxurious life, and that's why they did not see a reason to make peace because they were not paying the ultimate price for the war. It was the ordinary Afghans. It was the Afghan national security forces and the Afghan political and military leadership that were paying the price for it. I think the Taliban uh, takeover of the power, the, their presence in Kabul, is not only a, a massive foreign policy failure or intelligence failure, it's beyond that. And I think the United States understands that, the United States allies and partners understand that, NATO understands that, and I'm pretty sure that they're actively engaging hmm. to, to come up with a solution to ensure that the ammunition that we have right now in Taliban possession hmm. is not used, hmm. uh, is not used against civilized nations. All right. And how they could make and how they can make sure that, that it does not happen to be used by, by, by the Taliban uh, to harm civilized nations is to ensure an inclusive government mm -hmm. with strong democratic elements. Mm -hmm. Other than that, there, there's all kinds of uh, expectations from what will happen. Okay. So I, I'll take that point forward. G. Parthasati, do you think India should be building pressure on NATO? Because yesterday, in the joint statement, NATO did mention that they are going to draw lessons from what their engagement in Afghanistan has now led to. I think there's much my colleague uh, uh, who's here, who can, 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 Mr. Sina, can, Ambassador Sina can say. But I'd like to say one thing. Hmm. I am delighted that it Foreign Minister Qureshi is going to meet the Taliban. Hmm. So they, in fact, one of my Pakistani friends, a good friend of mine, told me that Qureshi is the greatest Indian asset you've got, he told me. Qureshi, <laughs> <laughs> let's see how he handles the delicate negotiations. He's not known to have done very well. But coming to the larger issue, as I said, and uh, I'm, I'm sure my colleague, Mr. Sinakeng, Ambassador Sina can tell you much more hmm. that we we are uh, should learn to play it cool, hmm. not hmm. get excited over one event or another. Hmm. They have in they have earned the wrath of half the population of Afghanistan. In also you now now have in place the uh, Tajik resistance led by uh, uh, former Vice President Amrullah Saleh and including Ahmed Shah Masood's son. We just have to sit, watch, watch this play out. Okay. Because okay. as someone said, this, the, the, this is Afghanistan is not an easy country to govern, hmm. and you cannot govern it by the fiat with the gun. And I think the ambassador would be able to, to right. tell you that even right. better than me. Ambassador Sina, can India also work on the goodwill that it has with the ordinary Afghans? Yes, of course. That has been our strongest uh, sort of. Um, card. Uh, it's the people-centric policies. And I think we need to uh, really do a charm offensive. Uh, and even Taliban has acknowledged it, actually, in, in whatever messaging that they have done informally, formally, in, in, in press conferences, that they have noticed that India has been purely focused on development of their own country. Now, that's a great sentiment uh, to sort of infuse further uh, in, in the Taliban forces. They have also, I can tell you, they have never attacked any of the infrastructure projects that we did because they realized it was being done for their people. 
uh, except recently we saw some Salma schools dam. being uh, Salma Dam, etc. Yes. They have captured the area, but they have not damaged the dam. Hmm. What they did do was burn down some of the schools, which may not be really built by India, but the fact is that they destroyed infrastructure. Uh, so there is, you see, and just remember that even when the earlier Taliban regime, we did have humanitarian relationship. We allowed flights to come to Amritsar, though we did not recognize the government, basically because of medical assistance that Afghans need. Hmm. And that demand will not go away just because Taliban takes over. And today, they, of course, they are trying to see whether they can build a broad-based, inclusive government. Hmm. Uh, and because only then they, be, they feel that they will have some legitimacy. Hmm. Uh, obviously, Mr. Qureshi is coming to do some firefighting, but also be present when the leadership of Taliban comes there because Mr. Qureshi, unfortunately, first cannot stop from shooting his mouth off, and then it is very difficult for him to resist from taking credit Hmm. So I agree with Ambassador Partha Sarthi hmm. uh, that uh, Pakistan has been, in the last 20 years, I feel, one of our very good friends in Afghanistan in terms of shaping the Indian policy, okay. which has stood us in great stead. Okay. All right. I'll have to leave it at that. Many thanks to all our panelists for joining us here on this discussion this evening. Well, chaos and carnage have gripped Afghanistan with evacuation operations in complete disarray as thousands try to flee the war-torn country. CNN's Clarissa Ward gets us this report from the Kabul airport before she took an evacuation flight with her crew. After three weeks in Afghanistan, we join the crowds at Kabul airport, now the only way out of the country. There's a huge block here, lots of cars. Hundreds of people wait in the blistering heat, hoping for a flight out. So we just managed to get into the airport compound and uh, I have to say it was, it was pretty intense. It was just like this crush of desperate people and screaming children and women and babies. And um, yeah, it's not often you really see desperation like that. The few people that do make it are exhausted and scared, but they're the lucky ones. They've made it past the Taliban checkpoints, Afghan security guards, and finally, the airport gate. But they can't forget those who they left behind. We're getting out, we're happy for that, but we're heartbroken for our country, especially for those who can't get out, those who are stuck here, and we're really heartbroken, our heart bleeds for them. What do you feel for all, all the mothers with young daughters who will now be growing up under Taliban rule? Pain, lots of pain. The back of a pretty long line now. Uh, transportation's under strain, they said, and obviously the priority is getting children uh, and babies out as soon as possible, but I think we'll probably be here quite a while. Do you work for the U.S. military or? Not military, but uh, we are working with the Ministry of uh, Defense. Defense. In Afghanistan. But we are also work uh, um, with the foreign people too. And so you have visa? Yeah. As we interview this couple, suddenly shouts behind us. A vehicle speeds through. That's a newborn baby that just flew past in that vehicle. That was a newborn. Did you see the baby? It was this big. The baby, we find out, has heat stroke and needs treatment. A reminder for these families that they're close to safety but not there yet. We stand in the blazing hot sun for hours. Everyone seeking what shelter they can. <laughs> Patients wearing thin. It's an agonizingly slow process, but finally we're allowed inside. Out on the tarmac, now safe, but the chaos continues. I've been waiting for two days, yesterday since 3 a.m. Yesterday since 3 a.m.? Yes. Tell me what the situation was like trying to get into the airport. It was really busy and a lot of people were just fighting and trying to make way for themselves. But we pushed through. 
We are certainly some of the very lucky ones here. Others, as you heard from that young man, have been waiting for two days. Others we saw getting turned around, sent back, told you don't have the appropriate paperwork. And there's no question everybody here is doing their best, but it's not clear if it's fast enough, if enough people can get out, and how much longer they have to finish this massive operation. Let's move on now and do a quick check of some of the other stories that we're tracking right now. 14 people have been arrested from across Assam for supporting the Taliban takeover on social media. Police say they are monitoring social media for inflammatory posts and taking action. As the fight over the abrogation of Article 370 continues, PDP Chief Mehbooba Mufti has warned the centre using a Taliban analogy. Mufti said that the government should draw lessons from how Taliban threw out a powerful country like the United States. She also urged the centre to hold talks with Kashmiris and restore the special status of Jammu and Kashmir. <laughs> A big success for the forces in Jammu and Kashmir. Three Jaish e Mohammed terrorists were killed in an encounter with security forces in the Tral region of Jammu and Kashmir. Ahead of Uttar Pradesh elections, Finance Minister Nirmala Sitharaman launched the third phase of the Mission Shakti in Lucknow, which aims to deliver safety and economic empowerment to women. Sitharaman also lauded Yogi Adityanath's Vikas record in the state. A good news on the vaccination front, Maharashtra has administered over 1 million doses in a single day, the highest ever in the state. The previous record was 9.64 lakh doses on the 14th of August. With that, we're taking a very quick break. News and updates will continue. Stay with us.